everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Hepatitis E, the New Challenges of a Peculiar Viral Hepatitis. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin. To learn more, visit diasorin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Valentina Svitcher, PhD, Associate Professor of Virology at the Department of Experimental Medicine and Surgery, University of Rome, Tor Vergata, Italy, and Romina Salpini, PhD, Assistant Professor at the Chair of Virology, Department of Experimental Medicine, University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Dr. Svitcher and Dr. Salpini, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to have uh, this presentation today. Hepatitis uh, E virus, HEV, is uh, a peculiar and uh, fascinating virus. It was uh, recently discovered, indeed, it was discovered during the 80s, in particular in the setting of an outbreak of hepatitis broke out in soldiers during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. HEV is uh, usually recognized as a naked virus with a positive sense RNA genome. Amazingly, different studies have found that HEV can exist either in the form of naked or enveloped viral particles. Although devoid of the classical surface glycoproteins, these enveloped viral particles are fully infectious and can establish new rounds of replication. In particular, a careful examination of HEV replication cycle uh, has, has shown that the infected hepatocytes can release enveloped viral particles. And the fate of these enveloped viral particles depends on whether they enter the bile ducts or the bloodstream. In particular, viral particles entering the bile ducts lose the envelope due to the detergent activity of the bile source. So these viral particles become naked, enter the gastrointestinal tract, and are released through feces. A different phase fate is observed for viral particles entering the bloodstream. Indeed, these viral particles don't lose the lipid-derived membrane, they remain enveloped. And this envelope plays an important role. Indeed, it allows HEV protection from neutralizing antibodies. So these enveloped viral particles play an important pathogenetic role since they allow HEV dissemination in different body compartments, playing a pivotal role in the onset of HEV-related extrapathic manifestations. HEV is an RNA virus, so it is characterized by a high degree of genetic uh, variability that has allowed the virus to differentiate into different uh, genotypes. In particular, so far, eight genotypes have been identified characterized by a very large host spectrum. Among them, four can infect humans. In particular, it has been estimated that HEV ancestor has spilled over from animals to humans around 1,000 years ago, and then it has diversified in genotype 1 and 2 and genotype 3 and 4. In particular, genotype 1 and 2 are characterized by an host spectrum restricted to humans 
Conversely, genotype 3 and 4 have, have an off spectrum involving not only humans but also animals, highlighting the existence of a large animal reservoir that plays an important role for the dissemination of the virus. This slide reports the geographic distribution of HEV genotypes. As you can see, the uh, distribution, the circulation of genotype 1 and 2 uh, is frequent in uh, India, Middle East, Africa and Mexico. Conversely, genotype 3 is ubiquitous and it is responsible of the majority of cases of HIV infection in Europe or in the Americas while the circulation of genotype 4 is more restricted, particularly to China or more in general in Western Pacific countries. Furthermore, the process of HEV genetic diversification is still ongoing and indeed has shown in this recent study genotype 3 has been further diversified into a large variety of sub-genotypes with a different geographic distribution. How is HEV transmitted? HEV can be transmitted by a very large variety of routes. In particular, the uh, waterborne transmission and the zoonotic transmission are considered the classical routes for acquiring HEV infection. Waterborne transmission is typical of genotype 1 and 2. It is caused by drinking water contaminated by human feces infected with genotype 1 and 2. However, it cannot be excluded the contamination of drinking water by animal feces infected with the genotype 3 and 4. Furthermore, among hepatitis viruses, HEV is the only one that can be transmitted zoonotically. In particular, zoonotic transmission is typical of genotype 3 and 4. It is caused by direct or indirect contact with an infected animal but most importantly, it can be caused by the consumption of contaminated food. And in particular, the consumption of raw or, or undercooked meats of swines, boars, deers and sheep plays an important role for the transmission of HEV uh, infection. Furthermore, it has been also postulated that HEV can be transmitted by the consumption of shellfish or by the consumption of vegetables or red fruits uh, irrigated by contaminated water. And you can see in this slide the very high percentage of muscles positive to HEV. However, beyond the waterborne or zoonotic transmission, HEV can be also transmitted parenterally, in particular by blood or blood component um, products. In particular, uh, these uh, different uh, studies worldwide have found that the uh, proportion of blood donors with uh, an acute HEV infection at the time of blood donation is not negligible. There's a substantial proportion of blood donors positive to HEV infection. In some European countries, uh, this uh, proportion is particularly high, such as in the Netherlands. Furthermore, as supported by this study, the duration of acute HEV infection can be particularly long and can last more than three months, increasing the probability of HEV transmission. 
parenteral HEV transmission can be asymptomatic. However, in immune suppressed patients, parenteral HEV transmission can be associated with an increased risk to develop a chronic HEV infection. Furthermore, in individuals with an underlying chronic liver disease, parenteral HEV transmission can cause fatal acute on chronic liver failure. For this reason, the scientific community is debating the importance to introduce HEV screening in the setting of blood donation. And some countries, particularly some European countries, have already introduced such a screening in blood donors. Beyond parenteral transmission, HEV can be transmitted also vertically. In particular, this recent meta-analysis has shown a quite high proportion of vertical transmission in pregnant women who acquired HEV infection. In particular, the risk of HEV vertical transmission was around 37%. As we discussed also later, vertical HEV transmission can be associated with low weight at birth, with premature delivery, but also it can be also associated with stillbirth or intrauterine abortion. Finally, there's also increasing evidence that HEV can be transmitted by solid organ transplantation, in particular by liver transplantation as expected since HEV is an hepatotropic virus. However, there's also the evidence that HEV can be transmitted in the setting of other solid organ transplantations such as kidney graft. We know that the transplanted patients must receive immune suppressive agents to uh, reduce the risk of organ rejection. But this condition of immune suppression can increase the risk to develop chronic infection. Finally, uh, there's the evidence that HEV uh, could be uh, transmitted sexually. And in particular, I would like to share with you this recent study published on Journal of Hepatology. This study has shown HEV detection in seminal uh, fluids from individuals with a chronic HEV uh, infection. This study has two interesting findings. In particular, the former is that the shedding of HEV in seminal fluid can be particularly long. In particular, it can last up to nine months. The, the latter is that the authors found a genetic compartmentalization, implying that viral species detected in seminal fluids are genetically distinct from those observed uh, circulating in the bloodstream. And this uh, suggests a potential role for testes as a niche, as a reservoir for HEV replication. So the large variety of routes for acquiring HEV infection strongly supports the importance to set up a proper and adequate HEV screening for a prompt management of HEV-infected patients at risk to develop severe clinical manifestations. And so what about the pathogenetic implication of HEV? HEV is uh, usually considered a non-cytopathic virus and the, uh, the extent of immune, the extent of liver damage usually depends on the strength of immune responses. In particular, acute HEV infection can run asymptomatically in the majority of HEV infected patients. In individuals developing uh, hepatitis, the classical symptoms are vomiting, nausea, jaundice, and also flares in transaminases. 
mortality rate is less than 1%. However, a completely different scenario is observed in individuals with an underlying chronic liver disease. In these patients, an acute HEV infection can cause an acute on chronic hepatitis that can lead to fulminant hepatitis and decompensated cirrhosis. And here we have a mortality rate of around 70%. A critical aspect is represented by the fact that these HEV-related acute on chronic hepatitis is often unexplained, remained unrecognized or even more misdiagnosed as, for instance, drug-induced liver injury. So this highlights an important concept. This highlights the need to raise awareness on HEV EV infection in order to set up a, an adequate screening in all individuals uh, at risk to develop severe complications such as individuals with an underlying chronic liver disease. There's also the evidence that the outcome of HEV infection can depend on HEV genotypes. In particular, genotype 1 and 2 are usually considered more virulent than genotype 3 and 4 and are associated with the most severe forms of hepatitis. A category of individuals deserving particular attention is represented by pregnant women. An infection sustained by genotype 1 in pregnant women is associated with a 30% risk to develop a fulminant hepatitis failure. Furthermore, infection by genotype 1 has been associated with the onset of severe placental diseases. And these severe clinical manifestations are typical of genotype 1 and have not been observed for other genotypes such as genotype 3. In particular, this is an interesting study aimed at comparing the efficiency of um, HEV replication, in particular of replication of genotype 1 and 3 at the maternal-fetal interface, represented by the decidua and placenta tissues. The study shows that Genotype 1 is characterized by uh, a higher efficiency of HEV of replication and can invade more efficiently uh, the decidua and the placenta than genotype 3. Furthermore, compared to genotype 3, genotype 1 is associated with a higher amount of apoptotic cells and it is also associated with a higher secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These results have been confirmed also uh, in this study, again supporting, reinforcing the pathogenetic role of genotype 1 in the setting of pregnant women. HIV infection is usually uh, considered a self-limiting infection. However, there is strong evidence that HIV can also establish a chronic infection, in particular in the setting of immune-suppressed individuals. And this is a typical feature of genotype 3. Chronic HEV infection is defined as the persistence of HEV RNA in serum or in the stool for longer periods, in particular for more than three or six months. Chronic infection can be asymptomatic. However, there is a 10% of individuals developing chronic HEV infection who rapidly progress towards cirrhosis that can lead to patients' death if not properly treated. The risk to acquire chronic HEV infection depends on different factors. 
First of all, the amount of immune suppression. In particular, it has been shown that uh, uh, transplantation is associated with the highest risk to acquire chronic infection. In this setting, we have a risk of 50-60% of chronicity. In patients with hematological or rheumatological diseases, the risk to develop a chronic infection is around 30%. Furthermore, chronic infection has been also observed in people living with HIV. Here, the risk of chronicity depends on the levels of the CD4 T cell count, even if it has been shown that chronic infection can persist even after the immunological recovery driven by antiretroviral treatment. Another factor that can modulate the risk to establish chronic HIV infection is represented by the type of immune suppression. In particular, it has been shown that the use of tacrolimus is associated with a higher risk to develop a chronic infection than cyclosporin A. In vitro studies have also shown that Calcineurin inhibitors are characterized by a direct proviral activity, so they can directly stimulate HEV replication. Conversely, mycophenolic acid can suppress the replication of the virus. And uh, overall, this uh, suggests the possibility to uh, modulate the choice of immune suppressive agents in the setting of uh, organ recipients undergoing an HEV infection. Finally, the risk to establish chronic infection can also depend on viral factors and in particular on the extent of HIV genetic variability, as shown in this study. In particular, this study shows that patients developing chronic infection are characterized by a higher degree of genetic variability at the time of acute infection, implying the emergence of immune escape mutations that could favor the persistence of viral replication in the setting of a weakened immune response. Is HEV only a matter of the liver? As I told you before, of course, HEV is an hepatotropic virus. However, there is strong evidence that HEV can be associated with a large variety of extrahepatic clinical manifestations. And in particular, the most common extrahepatic clinical manifestations are <coughs> neurological disorders, hematological disorders, or kidney injuries. The extrahepatic uh, um, clinical manifestations can be due to a cross-reactive immune response to HEV. However, they can also be caused by a direct viral replication in tissues other than the liver. Indeed, different studies have found, have detected intermediate of the viral replication in different uh, tissues such as the brain, kidney, spleen, small intestine, and uh, as we discussed before in placenta. Let's focus on neurological disorder. In particular, the onset of neurological disorders have observed in the setting of infection sustained by genotype 3 in Europe or by genotype 1 in Asia. Neurological disorders usually emerge in immune competent individuals, however, they have been observed also in the setting of immune suppressed patients developing a chronic infection. Most importantly, neurological disorders can be the only symptoms associated with HEV infection, so they can emerge even in complete absence of liver symptoms, becoming 
the dominating symptom associated with HEV infection. And this has an important implication for a proper identification of individuals candidate to HEV screening. This study has also uh, found a quasi-species compartmentalization, again, as we have discussed for testes, suggesting that viral species circulating detected in the brain are genetically distinct from those observed in the bloodstream, suggesting the emergence, the selection of neurotropic variants. We have uh, discussed uh, during the presentation different uh, categories of individuals that are at risk to develop severe complications associated with HEV infection, underline the importance to have uh, uh, effective uh, drugs to treat uh, uh, HEV. However, so far there are no approved drugs for the treatment of HEV infection and the patients are usually treated with broad spectrum agents represented by PEG interferon or rabivarin. However, these drugs are not indicated in pregnant women. For this reason, the scientific community is investigating novel compounds. For instance, sofosbuvir is an inhibitor of a viral polymerase. It is already approved for the treatment of hepatitis C virus. Sofosbuvir has been tested in uh, immune-suppressed patients developing chronic infection and not responding to rabivirin. It has been shown that sofosbuvir can reduce viral load can reduce the extent of HEV replication, however, it cannot cause the clearance of the virus. Other compounds are under investigation targeting viral polymerase but also viral helicase. And in particular, these compounds seem to have a promising um, efficacy, particularly when they are combined with immune modulants, such as interferon lambda, supporting that in the next future, presumably, uh, the approach to treat HEV infection can be represented by a combination of an antiviral plus an immune modulant agent. So, in conclusion, HEV can be acquired by a large variety of routes, and so this fuels the transmission of HEV infection worldwide. HEV can be associated with severe forms of hepatitis, in particular the categories of individuals that are at risk to develop these severe forms of hepatitis are pregnant women, in which we have a 30% risk to have an acute hepatic failure, but also in patients with an underlying chronic liver disease. As we have told before, in this setting, HEV-related acute and chronic liver failure is often unrecognized or misdiagnosed. Finally, HEV can establish a chronic infection in the setting of immune-suppressed patients, and this chronic infection has been associated with an increased risk to develop cirrhosis. So, overall findings highlight the importance to raise awareness on HEV and thus to promote an adequate screening in all individuals that risk to acquire HEV infection, in particular those uh, that are at risk to develop severe clinical manifestations. I thank you for your attention and now I can go over to uh, Romina's presentation. Thank you, Valentina, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, the epidemiological and uh, the um, diagnostic aspect related to hepatitis E. 
Hepatitis E virus is the most common cause of acute viral hepatitis worldwide. And according to this WHO-funded modeling study, each year, 20 million people are estimated to be infected with HEV, with 3 million of symptomatic cases, 70,000 of deaths, and 3,000 still births. Despite this huge number, the global burden of hepatitis E, as well as related morbidity and mortality, is likely to be significantly underreported, mostly due to a limited spread of diagnosis screening and the paucity of national surveillance program for hepatitis E infection. And according to this recent meta-analysis that included the study of HIV prevalence collecting data from 75 countries of the six continents, there is an estimation that up to 1 billion people worldwide have been infected with hepatitis uh, E in the past. This means that HIV infection has uh, been reported in one eighth of global population. And 100 million people is uh, experiencing a recent or ongoing hepatitis E infection. Always according to this meta-analysis, the seroprevalence of the infection ranges from 6% in Oceania up to 21% in African in African continent. Indeed, the epidemiology of hepatitis E varies greatly by geographic location, and a two-sided epidemiological scenario is reported, with highly endemic countries mostly concentrated in the developing world, where the infection of hepatitis E causes more than 25% of infection on A and not B, and uh, endemic countries with less sporadic outbreaks. In hyperendemicity of A hepatitis infection is concentrated mainly in developing countries, mostly in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. In this region, there are large and frequent outbreaks that affect several dozen of people and are mainly related to the consumption of drinking water contaminated with fetal material. However, in the last decade, there is increasing evidence of frequent locally acquired hepatitis infections also in several developed countries, almost the entire Europe, North and South America, and Japan. In this region, there are several outbreaks related mostly to zoonotic transmission through the consumption of uncooked or undercooked meat and uh, blood transfusion and organ transplant are also reported as minor source of contagion in these areas. Thanks to the introduction of robust serological and molecular assay, now we know that hepatitis E is an emerging viral infection also in industrialized countries, with hotspots of infection revealed, particularly in some European countries as Germany, Netherlands, France, and Switzerland. And this datum is in line with the, the ACDC report that shows a tenfold increase of the infection cases in Europe between 25 and 2015, with a market rise in the last five years. And this evidence, together uh, with the uh, reporting that all 80% of cases are mainly diagnosed in Germany, France, and UK, where a well-established surveillance of HIV is established, highlights the fact that hepatitis E is a public health concern also in Europe and claims the need to implement the surveillance for the virus. And let's move to the diagnostic aspect of hepatitis E. 
This graph resumes the kinetics of the diagnostic marker during hepatitis E acute infection. RNA can be, can be detected in blue blood on stool three weeks post infection, and uh, the varimian and viral shedding in feces last approximately four six weeks. And around the time of clinical onset, also biochemical liver marker become elevated, and the antibodies against the virus start to appear. IgM first followed by IgG. IgM are short-lived and last three, four months. Differently, IgG continue to rise during the convalescent period and remains detectable also for years and probably according to more recent studies for lifetime. And this is an overview of the panel of the diagnostic assay available for hepatitis E. Immune assay detecting IgM are the most commonly employed methods for diagnosis a recent hepatitis E infection. This assay targets the immune dominant part of ORF2 and ORF3 proteins and an increase in sensitivity and specificity was reported in new generation assays respect to the past. The detection of IgG with IgM negativity reflects a past infection with hepatitis E. And this test is particularly useful for assessing the seroprevalence of the infection and to establish a vaccine response. Recently, some companies have also launched quantitative assays to evaluate the levels of antibodies class G. These levels can be particularly useful for patient monitoring during infection. Indeed, it is known that peaks of these antibodies predict convalescence and recovery. And a study published on the International Journal of Infectious Disease this year also showed that their level inversely and strongly correlates with viral load, suggesting the potential utility of EGG quantitative for estimating and predicting viral clearance. Furthermore, IgG quantification is also useful for predicting reactivation or reinfection cases. Indeed, according to recent study, low antibody titer is not protective against reinfection. This has been demonstrated particularly in the setting of solid organ recipients and further studies are needed to better assess this aspect in the setting of immunocompetent, of immunocompetent patients. Similarly, quantifying IgG is also useful to determine the protective antibody level after vaccination. This is a matter still to be determined, even if some studies suggest that a level above one WHO unit ML could be protected against infection after vaccination. Recently, some study have also assessed the potential utility of avidity index in determining and in diagnosis discriminating in acute uh, versus the past infection. Avidity test uh, estimate the binding affinity between the antibody and the antigen that is typically weak in the early stage of infection and increase in the later phase. Thus, a strong, it's, uh, a, an ability below 40% is a strong indication of acute infection, while, while the level above 60% can indicate past infection. However, there are some limitations. Primarily, the VDD index below, between 40 and 60% falls in a gray area that is difficult to interpret. Furthermore, 
there are no commercially available large scale essay for a bit determination until now. If serology is surely the mainstay for uh, diagnosis of hepatitis C in, in the setting of uh, immunocomponent patients, the situation is quite different in immunocompromised patients. In, this, in these cases, it's crucial the role of determining the levels of HIV RNA. Immunocompromised testing negative for IgM should indeed be tested also for RNA. Indeed, positive results for RNA or IgM is confirmatory of recent and active infection, but negative results for both markers are required to exclude an HIV infection. RNA is, is also used to identify chronic hepatitis E, and in the setting of chronic hepatitis, RNA levels is also used to evaluate the response of patients to the intensification of immune suppressive therapy or to antiviral therapy. Lastly, Recently, in the landscape of uh, HIV diagnostic, emerged another marker that is represented by hepatitis E capsid antigen, recently proposed for the diagnosis of acute and chronic infection. However, despite an improved sensitivity of new SA for the determination respect to older version, it remains less sensitive respect to HIV RNA. In spite of this suboptimal sensitivity, there is a good correlation between the antigen and RNA levels, and this rendered this marker a potential cost-effective alternative to real-time PCR, particularly for resource-limited settings. And this is the diagnostic algorithm for HIV infection recommended by the European Association for the Study of the Liver that recommends to use a combinatory approach based on both serology and molecular testing to diagnose hepatitis E. And RNA is particularly useful to diagnose both acute and chronic infection in the setting of immune compromission. How to interpret this marker? Always according to ESL guideline, acute infection can be diagnosed by detection of antibodies, positivity to IgM, and rising level of IgG. An acute infection can also be diagnosed on the basis of positivity to RNA or antigen together with serology or alone. For determination of chronic infection, the detection of RNA or antigen for a period higher than three months is crucial infection. Who should be screened and who should be tested for HIV infection? According to the guideline, all patients with biochemical evidence of hepatitis should be tested for hepatitis E as part of first-line virological investigation. Also, patients with other relevant conditions as decompensated liver disease, neurologic amyotrophy, Guillain-Barré syndrome and encephalitis should also be tested for hepatitis E irrespective of ALT results. And in particular, acute hepatitis E is an important differential diagnosis in cases of suspected drug-induced liver injury. And this is particularly true in all people well, the assumption of multiple medications can lead, can lead to a misdiagnosis of hepatitis E confused with liver injury induced by drugs. What about blood safety and hepatitis E? Uh, 
As discussed by Valentina, hepatitis E can also be transmitted by blood transfusions and the seroprevalence of hepatitis E among blood donors is quite high in several European countries and in uh, Asia. But of note, it's uh, even more important to remark that, it, that, that there is a relevant rate of varemic donors that was found not only in Asian and African areas, but also in many European countries. These highlights and support they need to consider routine screening for hepatitis E in blood donors. Either guideline at this regard recommend that all patients with abnormal liver functionality test after receiving blood products should be tested for hepatitis E. And regarding the screening, is a guideline suggest to evaluate the screening of blood donors also after a more refined study of risk assessment and cost effectiveness to understand the reliability of this approach. And the picture of screening study ranges for blood supply is very multi-phased with some countries opting for a universal screening of all blood donors as Ireland, UK, Netherlands and Japan, while other countries prefer a selective screening restricted to patients that have a high risk of developing complications, as France, Austria and Luxembourg. Also about, so there is debate about the screening a strategy to use because they some laboratory prefer individual donation um, screening while other prefer to pull together serum for screening purpose. Let's move to the screening of organ donors. Hepatitis E acute infection in organ transplantation is now known to be less rare than previously estimated. And this meta-analysis showed that the pooled estimated prevalence of acute infection in recipients of organ, of solid organ, is about 4%. However, most studies do not, does not discriminate between transmitted and the novel infection, mostly due to the lack of information related to donors. This French study was the first to show evidence of transmission of hepatitis E after kidney transplantation from a donor that resulted positive both for serology and for viremia before uh, transplantation. On this basis, this author suggests to consider a systematic screening of donors both by HIV RNA and by HIV serology. To date, UK defined the first guideline for hepatitis E in solid organ transplantation that recommend a screening strategy for HIV for all organ donors and this recommendation is also shared by the Spanish Society of Infectious Diseases and Clinical Microbiology. However, the detection of HIV baremia in a donor is not a criteria to exclude donation. But this will inform the management of the patient after transplantation. Let's finish with the prevention of hepatitis E. Prevention is surely the most effective approach against the disease and at population level, transmission can be reduced mainly by maintaining quality standards for public water, establishing proper system for human species, and strengthening 
the screening in animals addressed to human feeding. On individual level, infection risk can reduce by maintaining adequate hygienic practice, by avoiding consumption of water of an impurity, particularly in endemic setting, and by limiting consumption of uncooked and undercooked meats from pigs, wild boar, and deer. Today, there is also a vaccine that is available. It was developed by Chinese companies and approved by Chinese Food and Drug Administration in the end of 2011. And to date, however, it is still licensed only for China. The vaccine is a recombinant one, based on a portion of the capsid protein derived from genotype 1 hepatitis E. And the dimerization of this portion led to a protein domain of the native capsid protein that is responsible for eliciting neutralizing antibodies. Clinical data are really promising and show that the efficacy of the vaccine is uh, very high, 97% in both adults and uh, young people. And however, WHO calls for further study in order to evaluate the safety and the effectiveness of this vaccine in vulnerable population as pregnant women or immunosuppressed patients. Future challenges against hepatitis E relies in improving the strategy to fight the infection in terms of a better prevention by extending vaccination and by, by promoting safer hygiene measures and improve animal-derived food control. In terms of optimization of screening, by enlarging the diagnostic availability and by spreading the screening campaigns worldwide. And lastly, it's really important to focus on treatment in order to individuate new approaches for antiviral therapy. Only addressing these three relevant topics will permit to obtain the final aim to reduce the burden of the disease related to hepatitis E virus around the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Stitcher and Dr. Salpini for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, can the use of ribavirin be associated with the emergence of drug resistance? Thank you so much for this uh, interesting question. Uh, yes, the use of ribavirin uh, can be associated with the emergence of a drug resistance. In particular, so far, a mutation has been identified. This is the G1634R mutation in viral polymerase. In vitro studies have found that this mutation can enhance HEV replication um, during a treatment in presence of the drug. And in vivo studies have found that uh, um, this mutation can emerge and contribute to, to virological failure. Thank you, Dr. Spitcher. Our next question is, which is the seroprevalence and the outcome of HIV infection in HIV-infected patients? Thank you so much. This is another interesting uh, question. In particular, the seroprevalence of uh, HIV infection in people living with HIV varies worldwide. It has been estimated that uh, it is particularly high in Africa and in Asia, in which we can have uh, uh, a, a zero prevalence of around 
in Europe and in the Americas, we can have a zero prevalence of around 5 and 10%. The outcome of HIV infection in people living with HIV is uh, superimposable to that to be served in uh, uh, individuals uh, who are not infected by HIV. However, as we have discussed before, uh, we have a risk to develop a persistent a chronic HIV infection in people living with HIV and this risk uh, can uh, depend on the levels of the CD4 T cell count. Interestingly, it has been shown that people living with HIV can be at risk of HIV reinfection, uh, HIV reinfection that can be uh, diagnosed as the concomitant detection, concomitant positivity to IgGs against uh, HIV and um, positivity to H HIV RNA. Thank you for this uh, question. All right, thanks again, Dr. Svitcher. We have another question. Is there evidence of HIV reinfection? Thank you for the question. And uh, according to a recent study performing animal models, the risk of reinfection is quite high. In particular, in this study on rhesus macaques, 30% of animals experience reinfection. A reinfection that's correlated with lower avidity index and lower titer of antibodies. A recent large-scale study in China suggests that roughly 20% of symptomatic infection in immunocompetent individuals is probably caused by reinfection. And also in this case, the reinfection risk correlated with lower titer of antibodies. However, further studies are necessary to define the specific cutoff of antibodies that is capable to prevent the reinfection. Thank you, Dr. Salpini. Our next question is, is the, available, is the available vaccine active against all HEV genotypes? The vaccine was built on the capsid protein derived from genotype 1. And to date, most clinical studies were conducted in China, and the results show that the vaccine has high efficacy against genotypes 1 and 4 suggesting a potential cross-genotype activity. This cross-genotype reactivity is also confirmed by a recent immunological study published in Nature Communication, showed that vaccine-induced antibodies has a high degree of clonal diversity and recognize multiple antigenic sites and cross-react with all other genotypes. However, to date, there are no clinical data on the efficacy of the vaccination against genotype 2 and 3, the more common genotype among developed countries. It well, looks like that's all we have time for today. Thank you again, Dr. Spitzer and Dr. Salpini, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Diasorin, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.